my job is to not really necessarily talk to you about pigs because I don't know a lot about pigs, uh, and, but I know a lot about humans. And so my job here is to really explain to you uh, some of the research and some of the sort of basic understanding of what we're learning about the microbiome in humans because, as it turns out, that can be applied very easily to animal science, and in fact it should be and probably will be uh, in the coming years, and I think that there's a lot of benefits that can be seen from that. So you'll have to forgive me, this, this talk that I'm going to give is very human-centric, but whilst I'm talking, I want you to consider some of the things I'm talking about, how they might relate to, um, uh, to pigs in the swine industry. Okay, first slide uh, is, uh, is really just to, uh, to, to, to acknowledge the fact that uh, I am not just a, a university professor, but I also have a company. Uh, so I'm just uh, disclosing that uh, from the point of view uh, that, uh, that I do have a commercial interest in this area, uh, but the research that we do as part of the company that I founded, New Biota, uh, which was founded in 2013, uh, is really based on the research that I've been doing in my lab for a number of years now. And um, I also think that it's uh, relevant for this audience because I think that this is sort of like the beginnings of trying to translate what we're learning about the microbiome into medicine and potentially down the road into animal medicine. Uh, so uh, New Biota is a company that uses micro, uh, microbes from the microbiome as medicine, and uh, we do have a number of uh, clinical trials underway, so we're really quite advanced down this, um, uh, um, in this field at the moment, which is great. And one of the reasons that we are is, in fact, because uh, fecal transplants are a thing. And uh, so uh, because people are getting fecal transplants, um, what we're doing is essentially a cleaned-up fecal transplant, and so we've been able to avoid the step in the pathway to drugs, uh, to, uh, uh, to getting drugs um, approved, um, we haven't had to go through the animal path. So we've gone straight to humans. So we do have a number of trials underway. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, New Biota is also very interested in developing what we've done, what we've learned in, in the animal space. The problem is just time right now, but, uh, but we have got our eyes on that as well. All right, so just to give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, really I've split this up into four different parts. Very simple. First one, I'm going to ask the question, what is the gut microbiome? Second one, what does it do for you? Uh, third one, how does our lifestyle affect the gut microbiome? And the fourth one, how can we fix a damaged uh, gut microbiome? And so without further ado, let's uh, jump into that. Um, so we'll start with the first one. So first... Let's consider what we know about the human uh, gut microbiota. Uh, so by far, this is the most researched uh, microbiota that uh, we have in the medical field right now. Uh, the human, microbi human microbiota in general, but the gut microbiota especially. Um, and what we're learning has many very, many very important implications, as I mentioned, for animal health. And so we shouldn't forget that. So the first thing that I need to tell you that's a very important uh, fact uh, that, that you need to understand, and it seems like a simple one, but it's a really uh, fundamental point, and that is that we are not just human, uh, that we are in fact complex superorganisms of human and microbial cells, and we exist in a very delicate host microbe equilibrium. We are nothing without our microbes, and our microbes are nothing without us, and we cannot consider ourselves to be just human anymore, because we understand now how the fundamental part that these microbes are uh, 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 have in our health. Um, 100 trillion microbial cells call your body home. Um, if your body was a planet, then uh, the colon, especially uh, the gut, and especially the colon, would be its biggest super city. Uh, somewhere like your forearm, where it's pretty dry, would be a bit of a desert. And, uh, and uh, I suppose uh, somebody once told me that the inner ear is a bit like the UK, which I think is quite funny to <laughs> think about. And so we know most uh, about the bacterial species of the microbiome. There's around 200 to 500 different species present in the gut, which is a significant down uh, play of what we used to say, you know, about a thousand different species. And that was a little bit of a uh, misnomer. What we'd um, done there is, is overestimate the amount of diversity because of the early sequencing analysis that was done uh, that uh, had some faults in it. Now we've kind of improved that technology, and we're seeing more like 200 to 500 different species present in the gut. 
There are not just bacteria, though, and we shouldn't forget this. And although this talk is going to be very much about the bacteria, uh, because, again, it's what we know most about, I don't want you to forget that there are other things present there as well. So there are also abundant archaea. So archaea are a little, they look a little bit like bacteria. They don't behave like bacteria. They're ancient microbes, and they have very sophisticated biochemistries. You don't need to worry too much about them, but they, they are present, and they do important things. Methanogenesis, the making of methane, is the domain of the gut um, archaea, for example, and that's a very important process. We also have an abundance of viruses in the guts. These viruses can be eukaryotic viruses, but for the most part, they tend to be viruses that affect the bacteria in the archaea. We call them bacteriophages and archaeophages, although that's not a, not a uh, well-known term. There are also yeasts and fungi present, and uh, finally some protists and other critters uh, that we really tend to ignore, but uh, in my lab we've just uh, started to, to look at them in earnest, and uh, uh, that with a, um, a little bit of a bent to looking at uh, the non-industrialized populations around, uh, around the world. Uh, so Stuart mentioned that I spent a good deal of my first few formative years at Guelph going around Guelph picking up uh, stool samples. Well, we have expanded our horizons significantly, and we're currently doing some work looking at uh, the uh, Yanomami tribe uh, from uh, remote parts of uh, the Venezuelan Amazon, Amazon jungle to see what microbiome they have. And the answer so far is that they have a lot more diversity than we do in the West. It's another story for another day, but quite an interesting one at that. And, uh, and so uh, what we do find there, an awful lot of protists. So how human are we? So uh, again, you may have heard some early estimates uh, sort of saying that we're only 10% human. And in fact, those estimates were also based on some faulty logic, sort of back of the envelope uh, napkin calculations, which are probably not correct. Uh, so in fact, a few years ago, uh, Sander Fuchs and uh, Milo um, actually did a, a real study to, to actually try to count these cells. And they took an average reference human, around 70 kilograms, 20 to 30 years old. They reckoned, 1.7 meters tall, and reckon that this person would have around 30 trillion human cells in their body um, and around 39 trillion bacterial cells. So in fact, the ratio is not quite as bad as only being 10% human, but we are still in the minority and we are just talking about, again, the bacteria at this uh, point. Uh, we are one part human to 1.3 part bacteria. So uh, again, we are in the minority, but because each gram of feces contains around 10 to the 11 bacterial cells, that's around uh, 10 trillion cells in the average bowel movement. Uh, for a brief time after a bowel movement, if you feel more human, uh, then the reason is it's because you are more human. And that's actually uh, quite an interesting little factoid to bring out at uh, cocktail parties. So uh, microbes in the gut form communities, and microbes in a microbiome anywhere, in fact, form communities. This is actually a nice image that I've put up there. Um, you know, this is real science. Uh, this is a picture from um, uh, some work that we did some time ago uh, to try to bust a myth that uh, corn kernels, when you digest corn, uh, come out undigested the other end. Of course, that's a myth. They don't come out undigested. They are, in fact, digested pretty well. And we took some of the samples from inside the corn kernel to show that fact. And and uh, actually the images are so pretty that, uh, that I use them in, in my talks. And this is a good example of one. This is about a, uh, this is a 40,000 times um, scanning electron micrograph image of what we'd see on this corn kernel after it's passed through um, a particular television presenter who I won't mention. And, um, and this is what, uh, what we get. So you can see that although the bacteria, we might kind of consider them to be just kind of all looking the same. Um, actually, when you look at this kind of level, uh, you can see that they are actually actually quite different. Um, some of them look like uh, sort of peanuts, some of them look like they're wearing a fuzzy coat. And, uh, and if you look very carefully, you can see how they're, some of them are even connected to each other via sort of tendrils. Now, some of that might be artifactual, but in fact, we do know that microbes in communities do form um, uh, communication networks, uh, whether that be through direct physical contact or through chemical uh, messengers or both, um, that uh, is, uh, is something that is a very interesting and important area of uh, microbiological research at the moment. So, but it's very important to understand that microbes do form communities. So um, when we do microbiology, we don't do it very well at the moment. So like cl classical microbiology, we tend to pick one or two microbes and study them in isolation of other microbes. But in fact, microbes behave differently when they're with their friends as to when they do when they're growing on their own in a petri dish or whatever you're trying to grow them in. So it's actually very important in order to understand how the microbiome works is to study the whole microbiome. 
Another very important thing is that biodiversity, it turns out, is very important. Now, this isn't true for every microbiome, uh, but it's certainly true for the gut microbiome, that, uh, that the more diversity that you have uh, within uh, a limit that we haven't actually found yet, actually, uh, <clears throat> but the more biodiversity that's present, um, then the more, the more healthy or the more robust that ecosystem generally is. And so what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that if you were to stand in a rainforest, like in this picture here, imagine this rainforest is your microbiome, there are thousands of species in an average rainforest, and if you were to close your eyes and then remove one of those species from that rainforest and then open your eyes again, you're probably not going to be able to see what's missing very easily or very quickly, and outwardly nothing would really change because things that are still present will step up to take the job of the things which, were, which have now gone extinct. And so outwardly that means that you have this functional redundancy, we call it, which means that the ecosystem is able to function even if pieces are taken away from it. And of course that reaches a limit and you can push and push and push that ecosystem until you reach a low diversity where things can actually start to crumble, um, ecosystem can, uh, can start to collapse. And this happens when you have a low diversity of species. Um, it happened not too long ago, not too far from here in uh, Kananaskis when uh, the white pines started to die back because um, they're a keystone species in that ecosystem and were affected by the pine beetle. And, um, and that's partly because that ecosystem is naturally a very low diverse ecosystem just because the yeah, the uh, uh, environment here is uh, is very unique. You know, we're very high up here. It's very dry. It's very hot in the summer. Very cold in the winter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so there aren't that many species in that ecosystem naturally. So that when one species is damaged, like the white pines, it becomes very obvious that that's happening, and that ecosystem uh, was in danger for a while of collapsing. And you have the same thing going on in microbial ecosystems. If you if you keep whittling away at the ecosystem and removing species, um, then you're eventually going to uh, lead to an ecosystem collapse. And uh, that ecosystem will then not be able to function correctly. So um, as it turns out, uh, um, uh, microbiology and, uh, or ecosystems, if you like, at the uh, macro scale, so birds and plants and animals, they follow the same rules as, the, um, as microbial ecology. So these are the microbes that I just talked about. So it's very important to consider our microbes and the ecology of these microbes when we're talking about uh, the microbiome. Now, where does our microbiome come from? Well, babies, it turns out, are born sterile, we think, although there is some controversy a little, uh, about this um, at the moment. We still, the, pervading view, the pervasive view is that, in fact, babies are born sterile. Um, but they very, very quickly become colonized, and perhaps even um, uh, a few hours before birth, they start to become colonized as, uh, as they're moving, uh, as the waters break and they're moving through the birth canal. Now, uh, by three years or old, um, the, a human, anyway, uh, a, a mature gut microbiome has usually developed. So this is the time that uh, an infant has usually been weaned. They're eating a diet that, although it might be uh, uh, a little bit uh, bland, it's usually more like an adult diet than it is just milk. It's not just milk anymore. And at this point, the microbiome uh, becomes fixed in a, in a really interesting way that we're still just beginning to understand that seems to be related to how the immune system uh, communicates with the uh, microbiome as well. So by the age of three years, your microbiome becomes very as complex as an adult's microbiome. Um, it becomes more or less fixed in composition, meaning that the species that are present there will become the species that will dominate within that ecosystem. And that domination um, uh, means that that ecosystem becomes quite difficult to change in a way that we're still trying to uh, study in the lab right now. And it's maintained for uh, very long periods of time, certainly years, and perhaps even for life or in, certain, uh, in certain contexts, although uh, that obviously is very difficult to study, and so uh, the jury's out as to how long exactly a microbiome can last. But the point is that once you have established your gut microbiome by the age of about three, it becomes very, very difficult to change it. Okay, even if that ecosystem is less diverse than perhaps it, uh, it should be. So that's an important point. So moving on, um, I've told you a little bit about what the gut microbiome is. So the next question is, of course, what does the gut microbiome do for you? Well, I guess the question is, what does, it, what does it not do for you? Because the more that we look, the more that we find how important this is to human physiology or animal physiology, and in, in, in any animal it's the same. 
Um, so I suppose um, these, are, these are just a few of the things that are listed, but some of the most important ones. Uh, the microbes in our gut uh, regulate our immune system. And uh, we know that uh, is, uh, is very true, uh, and we think that that is actually underlies, or that, that underlies this idea that the microbiome becomes fixed by about the age of three. It's when the immune system has started to, uh, uh, ha has developed enough to be able to kind of cause some of that homeostasis. And so regulation of the immune system is actually a very important process that the gut microbiome uh, carries out. It's a, it, you can think of it as an educator, if you like. So there's a, sort of all sorts of antigens within that gut microbiome that, uh, that educate the immune system how to respond appropriately to threats. And I think that's a very important um, uh, aspect of the microbiome. Um, of course, the gut, uh, the gut microbiome in particular is very important for helping to extract energy from foods. And so the foods that make it down to the colon in particular, uh, these are things like fibers, resistant starches, things which, can, which we as humans can't digest very well. The microbes in our gut can digest them very well. In fact, this is some of, uh, for some of them, it's their favorite food. And by doing so, they produce metabolites which we can absorb and utilize as energy. And so they do help us to harvest energy from foods that we would otherwise not be able to um, access. Um, our gut microbes also help us to control potential pathogens. This is a really important one that I'm going to touch again, touch on again uh, in just a second. Um, they make some essential metabolites, including vitamins and cofactors. Um, they improve intestinal function. Uh, they help to, for example, to regulate peristalsis. They remove toxins and carcinogens from our diet. Uh, you have to remember that the microbes in our guts have had at least three billion years worth of evolution over us, probably longer. And so they know a lot more sophisticated biochemical tricks than we do. So biochemically, our microbes are far better than we are at processing uh, or carrying out certain biochemical work. And so as a result, they can uh, take compounds which would otherwise be toxic to us and they can reduce them or oxidize them or change them in some way uh, to make them less uh, toxic. And that's actually a very important role that they play as well. So all in all, our microbes, our gut microbes are as important to us as our liver, and none of us would consider for a moment that we could live without our liver, and I think that this is something that we should kind of take with us sort of going forward. So I mentioned um, uh, a little bit about pathogens and just uh, some examples from my lab. I haven't got too much of my own uh, science up here. This is really an overview talk, but, uh, but this is one example of some research from my lab uh, just to show you how important these microbes are, just a little selection. Uh, so for example, um, a number of years ago now, we found that gut microbes uh, can produce small molecules that augment the activity of host cells. There's a molecule called tetrahydrobiopterin, or BH4 for short. It's a very important cofactor of many mammalian regulatory enzymes. Um, and it turns out that it can actually be made by gut bacteria. And uh, there are people who live in this world with congenital biopterin deficiencies, and you wouldn't know it. And the only reason that you wouldn't know it is because they are colonized by microbes that carry out that work for them. So in other words, they have been, uh, they've been compromised by their own genetics, but that has been compensated for by the microbiome. And so the only uh, people you would see these, uh, these deficiencies in is usually very small infants because they haven't yet become colonized by the microbiome. And so uh, that was an interesting finding. Um, and then gut, the gut microbiota in general produces small molecules that interfere with the uh, virulence of known pathogens. Um, and we've done some work here in specifically in the uh, realm of uh, Salmonella enterica and also Candida albicans. <clears throat> Both of these um, uh, uh, pathogens, obviously we know them very well as pathogens, uh, but the thing is they can exist in the gut and they, when they, in, in, under some circumstances when they actually don't uh, do any damage. They're just like uh, existing in the gut, just growing and, and living there, but without causing any problems. <clears throat> when they're in that situation, in a sort of quiescent situation, um, they can, um, uh, they're basically being pacified by the, gut microbiome, by the gut microbiome. What's happening here is the gut microbiome is producing metabolites, and those metabolites specifically are very good at, um, uh, at telling these pathogens not to produce uh, their virulent strategies. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and so uh, for the example of Salmonella enterica, it has very sophisticated genes which are turned on in order to um, provoke, if you like, an attack on the host. 
And what these microbiome, what the microbiome, these particular microbiome uh, members that we've found are doing is producing a small molecule that binds to those, those genes and prevents them from being turned on. In other words, they prevent that pathogen from becoming pathogenic. In other words, telling it to sort of pass on through and to just uh, behave normally as like a police force for your gut. In the same way, we've found uh, different uh, molecules that do the same thing with Candida albicans, which has a, a, a sort of a, uh, an invasive stage as well as a resting stage. And what we find is that the microbiome's producing metabolites that keep the Candida in its, uh, in its resting phase so that it can't become invasive. Because actually, both of these organisms can actually carry out useful biochemical work when they're not being pathogens in the gut. So um, one of the ways that we can really look at how important the microbiome is to host physiology is to look in animals which have no microbiome. Uh, they, there aren't that many that are available. Most of the time, researchers use germ-free mice. They're very difficult to maintain, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the reasons they're quite difficult to maintain is that the animal husbandry is, is obviously more complicated, but because the animals are not very healthy. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, or, or a few of the things that, that they are absent in, for example, uh, they, they, have, they are absent and, or reduced for most classes of immune cells. Their fertility is terrible. They have reduced cardiac, cardiac output and bone mass. Uh, their in, their uh, intestinal mucosal cells don't regenerate very well. They're not, they're not, they're not very good at digesting their food, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Also of interest, they tend to be very an anxious animals, and they also tend to be very hyper-responsive to, um, uh, uh, to hormones, which um, uh, stress hormones. And so that's a very uh, interesting finding. And uh, this is all compared to uh, specific pathogen-free colonized animals or colonized mice. And, uh, and shows that these animals really need their microbiome. And so the microbiome plays a critical role in host physiology. And even though these animals are alive, they are not very healthy. And so it's a very important, uh, it plays a very important part. Now, a lot of these um, uh, problems can be mitigated by reapplying the microbiome back to these animals, although sometimes that's not enough because if that happens too late, then the animals still can't compensate. And they, uh, by, by developing in a germ-free environment, they have become um, uh, compromised, if you like. So moving on, then how does our lifestyle affect the gut microbiome? Well, the thing is that the pervasive advertising uh, message that we have in our world right now is that all microbes are bad. And that is something that really must change. So we have a situation where we see all of these sorts of things that you can buy in the supermarket or wherever, which are antimicrobial. And we're seeing this a little bit less now, thank, thanks to the FDA, which have banned a number of the antimicrobial compounds that are used in these things. Uh, but how many times have we purchased a hand soap uh, and we've decided to buy it because it is um, antibacterial? Right? We've probably never given it much thought but we're probably just thinking, oh, well, that, that's got to be a good thing because we don't want bacteria. Um, the problem is that um, only a tiny fraction of uh, microbes are pathogens. It's the pathogens that we're trying to target when we're using these antimicrobial substances. But these, um, <coughs> excuse me, but these uh, antimicrobial practices don't actually discriminate uh, between pathogens and microbiota very well, in fact, at all. And so we have a situation where we've got lots of people using lots of antimicrobial compounds to get rid of pathogens that they're also afraid of, uh, but that's actually doing more damage than good because we're killing off microbes which actually confer a beneficial effect as well. So many, many studies have now shown that the gut microbiota changes, changes significantly with antibiotic use that it takes a long time afterwards to return to baseline, uh, that sometimes it doesn't return to baseline at all, and repeated hits, in other words, if you have, um, if you're given a, an antibiotic and, uh, and it doesn't get rid of whatever your infection is, and so your doctor gives you another antibiotic, perhaps a different class, if you have multiple hits, then um, that, cha that causes vast change. That, that's like clear-cutting the rainforest uh, from which the ecosystem just cannot recover, or certainly not very quickly. And so I'm highlighting here just uh, antimicrobial use uh, as one example. Um, it's probably the most pervasive one that we have in our environment right now, the other one being diet. 
Um, but, uh, but these are uh, 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 considerable threats to the microbiome as it stands. Antibiotics in pregnancy can have pervasive effects in the offspring later on in life, even if those offspring do not take antibiotics. And so this is something that is, uh, that is even sort of follows through generations and is a, is a real uh, problem that we haven't considered. Now, the last thing I want to do is to have everyone leave this room thinking antibiotics are a bad thing. They are not a bad thing. They are a miracle of medicine. They are incredible. They have changed the way that we practice medicine. Um, but we haven't used them particularly well. And uh, we do need to sort of consider the importance of, uh, of, of using them only judiciously uh, for infection because of some of the effects that they're having on our microbiome. And part of the problem that we have is that in general, people have a fear of germs, okay? And this pervasive fear of germs is very inflated. So no one wants to go back to the time of open sewers and cholera, but we need to start taking a stand against unnecessary scaremongering about germs. And you see it everywhere, in television advertising, in magazines, and uh, you even see it in the hospital, which has hand sanitizers posted everywhere. Now, okay, so a hospital might be a special case where you don't want any sort of pathogens. The thing is, the best way to remove pathogens from your hands is to wash your hands with soap and water. And so by providing hand sanitizer, I could talk for a whole day about this, it's, it's really not a very good idea. So we need to stop that. We need to start thinking about, instead, thinking about using the microbiome as a way to manage the pathogens uh, without trying to get rid of the pathogens because uh, it's by trying to get rid of the pathogens that we end up uh, developing uh, resistance. So in general, uh, through this use of antibiotics, in particular, but other drugs as well. And also through our lifestyle. In the West, we have this terrible sort of uh, um, lifestyle sitting on the sofa, eating, uh, drinking pop and eating uh, hamburgers and things. Terrible diet uh, in general. Um, so from that, uh, a couple of researchers a few years ago now, uh, Marty Blazer and Stan Falco, came up with something that they called the missing microbiota hypothesis, which, um, which is a very important hypothesis that at the time was a little bit controversial, uh, but is now, as I'm going to show you, sort of uh, proving to be fairly true. So this basically is saying that these, um, uh, by using antibiotics, by, having, by using other drugs, by having a poor lifestyle, a poor diet, you're actually eroding the microbial uh, ecosystem that you have on your body. Uh, they were speaking uh, about the whole body. I'm talking more about the gut because it seems like the gut, as I said, is a super city. Um, and so if that happens, then you can end up with extinction events in this microbial ecosystem. And what is most worrying about this um, uh, hypothesis is that this isn't just a hypothesis for the here and now. This is a hypothesis that's spanning generations. So what he was showing and what you can see in the graph there, in the graph you can sort of see uh, that uh, this sort of block steps. Well, these steps are generations. And what is trying to be shown here is that for every generation, if a person within that generation takes an antibiotic or has some major upset of their microbiome, that microbiome may be uh, compensated for by acquiring other microbes from our environment. We don't live in a sterile environment. But the rate at which we're losing microbes may happen much faster uh, than, we, than the rate at which we can acquire new microbes from our environment. And that means that over generations, we're seeing less and less uh, microbial diversity. And we're now hitting a point where we're starting to see changes in our global health and chronic, um, uh, in fact, you know, chronic diseases, for example, um, that, uh, that we've never seen before that may, in fact, be related to having a less diverse microbiome. And this is true from the point of view of several studies are now coming out. It's very difficult to look at these kinds of things because they're sort of multi-generational studies. Uh, but when you, uh, this is a study that came out of the Knights Lab looking at um, uh, uh, immigration and uh, into, into the United States and how uh, that might be affecting the microbiome because obviously these are people immigrating from Thailand uh, to, uh, to the United States and how diet changes across the generations. And they did a lot of work to show that in these gen in, within these generations, we're seeing a loss of gut microbiome diversity 
And in particular, this group were interested in obesity, and uh, they were sort of uh, correlating obesity uh, with a loss of gut microbiome diversity and the generations as, um, uh, as they are sort of uh, growing up in the United States. And so this does seem to be uh, very supportive of this missing microbiota hypothesis. Obviously, though, very difficult studies to do. So how do we acquire our microbes? So as I mentioned, the baby is uh, uh, pretty much sterile when it's born, but then sort of picks up microbes by the time it's three, uh, or this person is three, then they've usually picked up their adult-type microbiome. And that happens um, uh, very quickly in life. Uh, the very early years and uh, weeks and months are, are very critical in this process. Um, even uh, vaginal delivery is very important uh, because you get a lot of microbes as you're passing through the birth canals, you're being born. Uh, breastfeeding is actually a very good source of microbes as well. And then interaction with the environment. You know, we see babies crawling around, putting things in their mouths. Um, we used to think that that's a tactile response to their environment, but now we're wondering whether in fact that is an evolutionary um, sort of ordained way of picking up microbes uh, from the environment. Now, the reason I've put this up as a sort of progressive microbial colonization is I just wanted to point out how many things that we do in general um, that affect that, um, that natural course of events. Now, what I don't want you to go away and think is that I think any of these are bad. None of these are bad. A lot of these things have been introduced to save lives, but they all have a, an actual impact on, uh, on, on the health of these, of these uh, children. And so... The other thing that's very important, as I mentioned before, but I want to mention again, just to hammer it home, is that the window for proper development of the microbiota is very narrow. So there are lots of examples associated with altered gut microbiota diversity. So when I say altered, I mean usually uh, damaged in terms of um, there's a reduced gut microbiota diversity, although in obesity, it just seems to be a changed gut microbial, mi microbial diversity. And um, now these are just associations. It's actually very difficult to prove causation. And then there are a number of diseases in this um, uh, group which we now have established causation. Uh, Clostridioides difficile infection for one is, is a very important one. Um, and the other one is colorectal cancer. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because I think it's important to understand the context is, is everything. Okay, and so many opportunistic pathogens act like bad teenagers in a subway station, and so in a crowded environment, they tend to behave themselves. You know, they, they can actually even be a force for good, and they can, uh, uh, you know, uh, pick up something that someone's dropped and give it back to them, or give up their seat for an old lady or something, and they can be actually behave as a sort of a stand-up member of the community. But as soon as the crowds are gone, then they tend to start behaving in antisocial ways. And so when you have a situation in the gut microbiome where you have a loss of diversity, you lose that sort of pacifying police force, if you like, and you allow the opportunistic pathogens to behave badly. And so opportunistic pathogens, including many commensal microbes, they carry uh, spray, spray paint cans all the time. They have the potential to be pathogenic, but they often don't get the chance to use them. It's only in that certain situation where, they, where the gut microbiome is kind of lost. So to finish up, I just want to talk about uh, some aspects of um, how we are thinking we can perhaps fix some of this uh, damage. Um, and, um, and again, I'm going to be really focusing on human health, but I think our speakers after me are going to talk more about um, uh, pig health, which I think is uh, uh, going to pick up on some of this. So uh, how do we fix the damage that, that we've done with, the, with the, all these lifestyle changes that we've made? First of all, can we fix dysbiosis with probiotics? And so the idea here is that if you take an antibiotic, you can just cancel out those negative effects by using a probiotic. And how many of you in this room have been to a GP who's told you that even? Few of you, yeah. So it's, uh, it's actually untrue, unfortunately. Uh, it's, it's not. It's not the case at all. There are many, many types and strains of probiotics. There are many, many manufacturers. Some of them are legitimate, but most of them, unfortunately, are not. And there are many overinflated claims. And this is as far too many celebrity endorsements. Uh, celebrities don't generally have degrees in microbiology, though they like to profess that they know an awful lot about uh, what they don't know about. There's actually very little actual science being done, which is a real shame, because where there is science being done, it's great science. 
So there is actually also, when the science is being done, not much of an understanding of microbial ecology at all. It's really just, we're just seeing a disease, so now we're going to give a microbe, and now we're going to see if it's, or give a probiotic and see if it has an effect, without really considering how that probiotic might affect the microbiome. And there's also this one-size-fits-all mentality. We have this idea that uh, you know, a probiotic product will be good enough to treat you know, Auntie Sarah's pro uh, 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 psoriasis, and as well, it's going to treat baby James's diarrhea, right? And we think the same thing is gonna do the same, is gonna have these effects. But everyone's microbiome is very, very different. The layperson's view of probiotics is quite different from that of a microbial, microbial ecologist. So the layperson's view is that you go to a supermarket and there's all these stuff, there's all these, these products which are begging to colonize your intestines. But there are two myths involved here. The first one is that the probiotics found in food are the same kinds of species that are found in the gut. That's, uh, that's not true. They're very different. And the second one is that probiotics colonize the gut. Now, there is some evidence um, that, uh, that some probiotics under some conditions may colonize the gut transiently, but for the most part, they don't. They will only be present in your gut while you're taking that, that actual probiotic. And the microbial ecologist's view of probiotics is a little bit different. The normal gut microbiota, remember, contains around 100 billion to a trillion colony-forming units per mil in the gut. And we are saying that a probiotic strain, one strain into these, you know, uh, one, spe one strain of one species into 200 species of two to five billion CFU per capsule, sounds like a big number. It, we're saying that's going to have a major effect on that microbiome. And that's not true. Like, it, it just cannot do that. It won't, will never have a major effect. It may have an effect, but it won't be a major effect. Now, the other problem is that probiotics are not well regulated. The study of 14 commercial probiotic products showed that many probiotic products contain unadvertised additional lactobacilli and bifidobacteria, whereas others are missing species listed on the product label. That's a real problem. And then many probiotic capsules contain far fewer than the number of microbial cells advertised. Another issue is that strain is extremely important, not just species. And so here's just two products. So one of them, Culturel, has actually been studied scientifically, and uh, there's, a lot of the, the, there's a lot of science to back up the claims they make. Uh, the probiotic species that is used and the strain is clearly labeled. On the right there is a generic uh, probiotic. The strain of, of uh, the species is there, but the strain is not even mentioned. And to a microbiologist, strain is everything. So there is no clinical evidence for efficacy. It's kind of suggesting that just because it contains the same species, that it'll have the same effect, and that's just not true. So we need to be realistic. As I said, we don't expect to use a drug designed to treat diarrhea for the treatment of psoriasis, so we can't assume probiotics or panaceas either. The benefits seen in clinical trials are generally modest at best. But the risk of side effects are very low. And so it is worth a try if you pick the right probiotic. And there are some things that you can do and some sites where um, uh, gastroenterologists are starting to look at this very seriously to help consumers try to sort of uh, get around this, uh, get through this area. The other thing I want to briefly tell you about are prebiotics, and these are foods uh, for your microbes. These are not live products. These are actually typically non-digestible fiber compounds, but your microbes digest them just fine. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach, just like a probiotic, but they are sold that way. And it's not a simple solution. Uh, fiber supplements are really not diverse enough. You need to eat um, uh, a very wide variety of fibers to support a very wide variety of microbes that live in your gut. And so they could be used much more cleverly. Now, matching prebiotics to probiotics uh, preparations to make symbiotics is actually a very good strategy for promoting beneficial effects. And so I think we need to do that more. And what about fermented foods? So these are coming back into vogue a little bit. Uh, fermented foods are naturally transformed by microbes to create novel textures and flavors. Um, the benefits of um, uh, fermented food might not actually be the microbes themselves, uh, but it will actually be their chemical products of fermentation. And why is that? So it turns out that microbes, as I mentioned right at the beginning, they communicate with each other. They also communicate with us. They don't talk to us using words. They use a chemical language. And the language tends to be with small molecules. Small molecules, that's important that they're small because they're very diffusible. They, they uh, don't see barriers of cell uh, uh, membranes, for example. 
And uh, so they're very easily absorbed by the host and they can have major effects on the host as well. Short chain fatty acids are a good example, but they're not the only ones. And what about fecal transplants now? I briefly want to just finish with this. So this is using a healthy donor's microbes to, repl to replace a sick ecosystem. Uh, you basically, it's pretty gross. You take a poop, you put it in a blender, you, <laughs> and you uh, mash it up, and then you give it to the donor. And you can do that in a number of different ways. My favorite is crapsules, which was actually invented by uh, Tom Louie out here in Calgary. Uh, encapsulated frozen or freeze-dried stool taken with a big uh, glass of Gatorade and uh, orally, which is pretty awful to think about, but it actually works. And for C. diff infections in particular, uh, this results in a cure of the patient in over 90% of cases, and you get a rapid resolution of disease and only rare occurrence of, uh, recurrence of infection. But, there's always a but, we don't yet understand the potential negative health implications of fecal transplant. How do we screen for unknown dangers? If all the donors are different, this is very little scientific value, we don't learn very much. Super donors can be very hard to find and they can become compromised if they get sick themselves. And for C. difficile infection, the benefits are clear, but the long-term effects of the practice, really we don't know enough about to say that it's safe. Uh, there's been some um, evidence in the literature of some unintended side effects. Weight gain is one. And death, unfortunately, is another. Uh, this happened last summer and uh, caused the FDA to put a halt on, uh, on, on fecal transplantation practice without a lot of uh, extra work done. So probiotics are generally very safe and defined. The industry is poorly regulated. The effects are modest at best. There's much hype and very little scientific proof. And fecal transplants have shown great promise in treating, uh, for example, gut infections, but there are lots of unknown unknowns, very difficult to figure out therapeutic effects, and they are rather disgusting. So a potential solution to this problem is the use of what we call microbial ecosystem therapeutics. Uh, so this is deriving pure, well-characterized microbes from healthy donors and applying them much like we would probiotics. It's safer and cleaner and easier than fecal transplant, much more effective than probiotics. Uh, so New Biota, my company, has been working with what we've established in the lab uh, to develop these as drugs, and they are being developed as drugs, not probiotics. Uh, this is uh, through the request of Health Canada and the FDA. So they are um, a biologic drug, I and mean, that's actually the hardest type of drug to get through regulatory processes, but we're doing it because we see that it's an important thing to do. Um, and uh, these, as I said, are for oral delivery to make things uh, much more simple. And it's predicated on this, is that the idea that, is that micros work better in teams. So a probiotic strain is single or a few species acting alone, they can't colonize the gut. But if you take an entire ecosystem, uh, they get my microbial synergy. These microbes talk to each other, they interact with each other, they cross-feed with each other, and they support each other overall to, to create a, a larger benefit. And they're much more likely to colonize the host, and in fact, that's what we're seeing in our clinical trials. So just to uh, whet your appetite for the next uh, speakers, so let's just consider what we know about pigs and the microbiota. So pigs and humans share several relevant attributes. They share body size, gross and uh, gastrointestinal anatomy, digestive processes, and an omnivorous diet. And the pig microbiota responds to dietary modulation in the same way as a human microbiota. In fact, the human microbiota researchers consider the pig as a very important uh, model for their research. And the gut microbiota is important to pigs as well. So many goals of animal husbandry are, medi uh, are mediated by the gut microbiota. Uh, a, maximization, uh, a maximization of digestive and absorp absorptive function, a minimization of, of, of colonization and overgrowth of pathogens, and a minimization of diarrhea and inflammation, all of these things which are very important uh, in the pig industry and the, animal, um, the business of raising animals in general. Promotion of an appropriate immune response and also maintenance of proper barrier function. But how pigs are reared, what they're fed, where they're housed, antibiotic use, et cetera, erodes, current, well, currently how this is done, tends to erode gut microbial diversity and thus animal health. And so I think we need to really start rethinking how we can um, raise animals in a way that really uh, considers their microbiome in the equation. So in summary, the gut microbiota is, uh, is essential to optimal human physiology. It prevents disease, it augments immunity and other health, uh, health functions. The gut microbiota is most optimal when its diversity is high. 
And gut microbial diversity has been damaged generally by lifestyle and dietary changes in the industrialized world with major consequences to health. And uh, new strategies to undo this damage are relevant both to human and animal health. I'm just going to quickly, even though I haven't really talked about the research in my lab, just acknowledge that most of the, uh, all the research in my lab is carried out by some very talented uh, people. And I'm funded by a great many uh, generous uh, funders. And that's all I have to tell you. I have maybe a few uh, minutes for questions, I think. And so thank you for your attention. Okay, so, so the question is, is really asking how much uh, does travel really factor into the microbiome? So if you're a person that travels around the world a lot versus someone who stays at home most of the time, uh, how, how different is that, how much is that gonna change your microbiome? Um, so I don't know to uh, how much research has really been done asking that question specifically. The work that I presented there, it's not, not my work, that's more about obesity and looking at a generational, from a generational point of view. Uh, uh, tracking people as they travel has also been done, but not in a large scale, usually just a few individuals here and there. And what you see is that as someone travels, um, let's say from North America to India and for a vacation or whatever, uh, you see usually some disturbances in the microbiome that's usually brought about by eating you know, uh, foods with local microbes. And so you do see those. And sometimes they actually cause disturbances. We know that as sort of diarrhea, um, but it tends to then as soon as uh, that person has finished traveling that comes back home, it tends to then uh, move back to the sort of baseline before. Now, that's, um, that's quite interesting. So it does seem to be, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the microbiome seems to be um, uh, placed, if you like, very early in life. And so you're, you sort of establish an ecosystem that works with the host and the host establishes that ecosystem. Homeostasis is very important in physiology, and I think homeostasis of the microbiome is one of those aspects. And so um, I think that, um, so we, there, there are studies that show that your microbiome tends to reflect where you were born and raised. Uh, rather than where you currently live. And so that's also of interest. Although I think these kinds of studies, we really need more of them. They're very difficult to do. And we um, uh, really need to understand how microbes can come in and colonize. That's the big sort of question right now. How does that happen? So I don't know if that answers your question, but there's, yeah. So I'm gonna ask a, qu uh, okay, I'll, I'll let you <laughs> ask your question back there because, I, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, um, are we looking to develop um, a microbiome therapeutic that is robust regardless of uh, what diet a person is going to eat? I think that the problem is in when you're developing a drug, you can't develop a you know, a personalized drug. It's just very, very difficult to do at this time. Uh, and so for, for New Biota's sake, we've had to kind of create an ecosystem uh, which, we which we deliver and uh, we're in the middle of the trials right now from what I can, I can't tell you much, but I can tell you that we, we do see colonization, but we don't know how long that colonization lasts and, and ethics only allows us to sort of follow people up to a certain period of time. So we don't really know uh, how much. Um, in the future, what I think we're going to need to be doing is instead of doing this one size fits all therapy, which I've obviously trashed, it's <laughs> actually what we're doing out of necessity, but I see it more as a sort of, we'll take a modular approach, uh, taking microbes and actually looking at a person's microbiome and their physiology to discover what it is that they need rather than just throwing things in to see what sticks. So I don't know whether that answers your question and how much the diet's going to play a role in that's actually very important. We think that this idea of uh, symbiotics, like providing a prebiotic with a probiotic is actually going to uh, help a, micro, micro, a particular microbe establish in a given person's gut. So diet is going to be extremely important in all of this, I think. So here's my question. As a grandparent, and when the grandkids visit, this idea that my mother taught me and that we're trying to teach our grandkids is eat your vegetables and you're going to get a variety of food. You're not just going to eat what you want to eat. Yes. And, uh, and my wife takes it as an insult if they don't eat it. So, so I guess that's really, I think my take home message is if it's imprinted by age three, that's when we need the diversity to occur. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then my 
Second question is, I had one granddaughter who had repeated ear infections and was treated with antibiotics and they wouldn't do anything, you know, wouldn't put tubes in until a certain age and wondering what her long-term effect is by that. Okay, so, well, first the question on the diet. So I think that uh, diets, unfortunately, in the Western world, we don't eat a very diverse diet, particularly in vegetables, fruits and vegetables, uh, compared to other parts of the world. So I think that if we, um, we, we need to do that better, it's very difficult with little kids. They don't like vegetables. But I have to say, from my own experience, that if you just provide them with that, <laughs> you don't give them too much of a choice, they're not going to starve themselves. And, uh, and actually, it, you can get past that pretty easily. It's just tricky to do. They're very manipulative toddlers. But the other thing is, uh, so part of my uh, research is actually is, uh, part of what we call the Guelph Family Health Study at Guelph, and there's uh, looking at uh, early lifestyle interventions uh, to prevent obesity later in life. Uh, so we're looking at uh, coaching parents and how to feed their children properly. It sounds like a, a terribly, you know, old-fashioned, fashion way of thinking about it, but actually it's working pretty well. Um, and and uh, I'm really just uh, showing that, that kids, if you provide them with these foods very early in life, they develop their food preferences very early in life. So if they haven't established a love of vegetables by the time they're about three, it's going to be very hard to make that happen. And so, uh, so trying to sort of keep them away from uh, sweet, sugary things, which obviously they're going to prefer, and to try to give them the option to eat healthy vegetables, although it sounds like something that, you know, we intuitively all know is the right thing to do, is actually uh, a very important thing to do because it really does help uh, through their lives. And then when it comes to antibiotics, um, I get asked that question a lot, and I'm not a medical doctor, yeah. and, and it's very hard, right, because as a medical doctor, you've got a situation where, you know, you could have an ear infection which could cause deafness, or you've got a situation where you're giving multiple antibiotics which could cause problems later in life. And making that um, cost versus benefit equation work is, is very hard to do. So, um, as I said, I, I don't want to be the person to stand here and say all well, antibiotics are bad, <laughs> because they're not, yes. they're patently not. But I think that what we need to be doing, especially for little children, is when we give them antibiotics, we need to monitor their gut microbiome, and we need to see that it does, in fact, bounce back after the antibiotic has been given, and if it doesn't, we need to intervene. And we haven't got there yet, so I think that's something in the future.